Hi everyone, uh, I'm Emily Sanford. I'm a grad student here in the Cool Worlds Lab at Columbia, and I'm here to talk about a paper that I've just written with David Kipping uh, that we're calling Know the Planet, Know the Star. And to give away the punchline, what we did is we used transiting exoplanets to measure the densities of the stars that they're orbiting around. Um, and I'm going to explain that when we get there. So if you're watching this video, you're probably already familiar with how we discover exoplanets via the transit method. Um, but it's like a stakeout, right? First we identify a target star or a whole bunch of target stars, uh, and then we go out and we buy a dozen donuts and some Red Bull, and we sit at the end of the street in an unmarked vehicle all night, and we watch them for telltale evidence that they have planets. In particular, what we're looking for during that stakeout are the tiny repetitive dimmings that happen when a planet passes between its host star and our telescope and blocks out some of the light. So the Kepler spacecraft staked out about 200,000 target stars for five years and discovered 5,000 exoplanets that way. But here's the really interesting thing about discovering planets by looking for transits. When you find one, your knowledge of that planet is then kind of all tangled up with your knowledge of its host star because you're discovering the planet by looking for that missing starlight. And this is so true that the unofficial motto of the Kepler mission was know the star, know the planet. So as an example, consider trying to figure out the size of a planet by watching it transit. We can figure out how big the planet is by how much starlight it blocks out during the transit. So in the extreme case, if you imagine a planet that's the same size as a star uh, that eclipses the star completely, it'll block out 100% of the light. Uh, whereas a small planet, small relative to the star, will only block out a tiny percentage of the light. So by measuring the amount of light that's missing during the transit, we can figure out how big the planet is, but only relative to the size of the star, so only as a percentage of how big the star is. If we want to know the absolute size of the planet, we have to know the absolute size of the star first. So to try to illustrate this point a little bit more clearly, I want you to think about two different transiting planet situations. Um, in the first, let's imagine a really enormously big star um, and a correspondingly big planet, maybe a planet that's half the diameter or so of the star. Um, you can ignore that this is the CMB. Um, not relevant for today's video, these are just round things lying around the astronomy department. Um, so a planet this big that's eclipsing a star this big will create a, a, a transit of a certain transit depth. Now let's imagine a different planetary system. Uh, a much smaller star and a correspondingly smaller planet. But the ratio of sizes of the planet to the star is the same. It's maybe half the diameter of the star. So the transit depth created by this transit will be the same as the transit depth created by uh, the previous planet-star situation. So the size of the planet uh, as a percentage of the size of a star was the same in those two systems, even though they were kind of different in terms of their absolute scale. And what that means is that their transit depths would be the same. So even though one system was a scaled up version of the other, the scaling up didn't actually affect the kind of observable physics. And in physics we call that similarity, when two systems exhibit the same uh, behavior regardless of their kind of absolute scale. And I want you guys to remember that idea, similarity. So from the transit, we can only get the relative size of the planet. And if we wanted to know its absolute size, we'd have to know the absolute size of the star. And we don't know that offhand in most cases. That requires basically follow-up observations of individual stars to figure out their properties. And then if they have transiting planets, we can understand the planets better as a result. So that's where the Kepler motto, know the star, know the planet, comes from. Um, and what we're doing is flipping that motto around. Um, and we're saying that if you understand transiting planets really well, you can actually learn some things about their host stars. Um, so hence we're calling this new paper, Know the Planet, Know the Star. So what can we learn about a star by figuring out its transiting planets? Um, amazingly, we can learn about the density of the star. And I say amazingly because it's really weird uh, that a planet which is orbiting some distance away from the star um, should be able to tell us anything about the star's interior. Um, but it can, so let's talk about how. So first, let's talk about what we actually observe during a planetary transit. Um, the first thing is the transit depth. We've talked about that already. That tells us the relative size. What we also observe is the transit duration. So that's kind of how long it takes the planet uh, from the very beginning of its transit to the very end of its transit. Uh, it's the time elapsed between those two points. And furthermore, if we watch this star for a while and we see this planet kind of go around and around and around, we can measure the orbital period, which is like the, the year of the planet, how long it takes to go all the way around. So step one, uh, if we measure those two things, if we measure the transit duration and the orbital period, 
uh, we can calculate the percentage of time that the planet spends in front of its star. So the transit duration as a fraction of the orbital period. Step two is that the percentage of time that the planet is spending in front of its star tells us how far the planet is from its star. And to understand that, how we go from a percentage of time to a distance, uh, I want you to think about the two kind of extreme cases. The first where a planet is basically as close as possible to its star, like essentially touching the surface of the star. Um, a planet like that is gonna spend 50% of its time in front and 50% of its time behind its star. And in the other extreme, where a planet is very, very, very far away from its host star, it's only going to spend a tiny percentage of its time in front and the vast majority of its time elsewhere, uh, just because it has so much more orbital ground to cover and only a small fraction of its orbit is actually crossing directly in front of the star. So by measuring the percentage of time that the planet is spending in front of its star, we can work backwards and ask how far away from the star must the planet be in order for that to be the right percentage. So I just want to quickly note that it's not an absolute distance between the planet and the star that we're measuring this way. Uh, it's actually a scaled distance. It's relative to the size of the star. But that same idea of similarity comes into play, uh, and we know that the laws of gravity and orbital motion are the same regardless of the absolute size scale of the system, um, so it doesn't matter. So step three, we can then use that knowledge of how far the planet is from its star combined with our measurement of the transit duration in order to solve for the stellar density. And you can think again about two extreme cases. If we have a case where the planet is very far from its star and yet takes a long time to transit, what that tells us is that the star has to be big, and that means it's puffy and it's low density. Um, in the other extreme, if we have a planet that's very close into its star and yet transits really quickly, um, that tells us that the star must be small and compact and high density. So this technique that we can get the density of a star just from the light curve of its transiting planets, um, that's actually not new. Uh, scientists first put that forward in 2003 in kind of the early years of thinking about transiting planets. But this is the first time that anyone's applied that technique to measure the densities of a large number of Kepler planet host stars. And in doing so, we find that we're able to achieve very high precision uh, in our stellar density measurements compared to other methods. Uh, and furthermore, that our estimates of stellar density agree with measurements of stellar density from those other methods. So this is a big proof of concept success that we can achieve this kind of precision and this kind of accuracy. So the next question is, now that we have these really precise measurements of stellar density, um, how can we use them? And one answer is that once we know the stellar density very well, in a sense, we've kind of locked down that star. We understand its properties. And that's really useful because if we discover further transiting planets in that same system, then we will understand their properties better as a result. So remember, when we discover a transiting planet, the knowledge of the planet and the star are all kind of tangled up together. If we can take the star out of the equation, then we can solve for the planet's properties much more easily. So it's kind of like we would know the planet, know the star, and then know the rest of the planets orbiting that star. And we think that that technique of using one planet to understand the star really well, and then using our knowledge of the star to understand other planets in the system, uh, we think that's going to be really important when NASA launches the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is scheduled to happen next year. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you have questions, please ask them below in the comments. And as always, don't forget to subscribe to see more updates from the Cool World Lab. big star and a big planet that's orbiting around. Ignore that this is the CMB, that is not relevant to today's video. <laughs>